All right, so we're jumping into our anchor verse. If you're new to Hope City, welcome. Uh, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting, just yeah, my name's Daniel. The beautiful redhead that was up here is my wife, Jackie, and we have the privilege of serving and leading this life-giving church called Hope City. And if you're new to Hope City, you, uh, uh, I want you to hear this part. I love to have an anchor verse. If you know Hope City, you call Hope City home, you know your boy loves anchor verses. So we're anchoring this weekend's message to this verse here, Romans chapter 8. Verse 14 on the screens. For those of, for, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. I'm gonna say it again. For those who are led by the, by, by the Spirit of God. Now that's a choice. It's a choice to be led. You, you ever, like sometimes I'll grab my kid's hand and they're like trying to pull away. I'm like, whoa, I'm leading this thing. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, are the children of God. Somebody say out loud, I'm a child of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you give us ears to hear, a mind to understand. We need a heart ready to receive. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Touch earth here, God, today. Let heaven begin to move, breathe in this atmosphere, and let every single one of us unanimously in agreement agree that you are in the room. Let us lead better, change, set free, healed, and delivered. If you receive a shout, amen. So if you missed last weekend, Pastor Peter, towards the end of last week, he talked about two different things that we wear. You can either wear a bib, how many of y'all remember this, or you can wear an apron. Now, it was uh, complex, pretty deep, but really simple. We understand the, the premise of a bib. So when you're little, like a baby, we're like, I got to feed you, I got to put on that bib. Or if you go to that seafood lover's night at Red Lobster, amen, you're like, can I get a lobster bib? Okay. So the difference between bibs and aprons are a bib is you're expecting to be served. An apron is you're expecting with expectation to serve. For those of you who were in the room and after sitting through last weekend's message, you decided, Pastor Daniel, I'm putting on my apron. Y'all, this weekend's message is for you. And right now, if you reach under your seat, every single one of you, we gave you an apron. None of you did it. You didn't get that was amazing. We have thousands of people. We're not buying aprons. That's ridiculous. Okay. I'm not going to pull that off. How, where, where are we even going to get aprons? That many aprons. All right. So for some of you, maybe uh, you've heard my story. You've heard my journey. And I'm so grateful to see the restoration that has happened in my family. My parents, give my parents a hand. They watch every single week. So I have to be careful because if I make any kind of pop shots about my mom, she's going to like today because I make a couple wonderful statements about my mom. But sometimes I'll make a couple little pop shots because I know she's watching and she'll text me in real time, Daniel. I'll say, don't bother me while I'm preaching, okay? But if you know my story, home wasn't always a place of peace for our family. And a lot of you know my dad's story that before he found the Lord, and thank God he did, it was the trajectory of our family changed when he fell in love with Jesus, but he was a broken man. And when you're broken, hurt people end up hurting people. And broken people end up leading broken families. And so we had a broken family. But when my father encountered Jesus, everything began to change. But what's funny about that situation was when my father found his home through a relationship with Jesus, our family's life shifted and we moved away from our home. So our natural home, our natural proximity to where we lived, it changed. I was raised in the Midwest, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I got to Texas as fast as I could. Amen. My wife's roots are here in Houston, so we're like, let's get to Texas. Amen. United States of Texas. I was raised in Columbus, Ohio, surrounded by family and friends. We had a phenomenal church that I was growing up in, and my family, we farmed. We were farmers. How many of y'all come from farmers? You know a farmer. You're on farmersonly.com. I don't know. That's where you're trying to find love. I don't know what your life is like. Anyway, so my family farms thousands of acres, and it's a slow life. It's a rural life, and some of you are like, man, that farm life, I don't know. It's a little too slow for me. It, it kind of, I like it. Like, one day, I feel like in my older age, you're going to see me out on a combine. Now, can't you picture me with Jays driving around on a tractor? I, I'm telling you. Anyways, my dad would wear shorts, and like, it's hilarious. Anyways, shortly after my dad gave his life to the Lord, he felt the call, the tug, because when you begin to develop a relationship with Jesus, you become hungry for the things of God. And the things that used to draw you away, drugs, alcohol, the things he was self-medicating with, they were not enticing to him anymore. So as he was growing in his faith, and he began to pursue the call of God on his life that he had been running from for years, again, I mentioned when he found his home in Jesus, 
we ended up leaving what we knew. And I was seven years old when we decided to leave our community, our church, our family, our friends. It was a pivotal time in my life of development. We uprooted and we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, so my dad could go to Bible college. And so we ended up in Tulsa, and I grew up there. And even at that age, I already knew that God was starting to teach me a lesson. He started teaching me about his grace. He started teaching me the lessons of life at seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to my junior high and high school years, that this uprooting, this adventure of faith, that all of these decisions, everything we were doing, it required trust, dependency, It required us to lean on the promises of God and recognize this, that home was ultimately where he is. That home was ultimately found in his presence. And if you're taking down notes, you can write that down because that's the title of today's sermon. Home is where he is. What do you mean by that? I discovered and my family discovered that home was not a place, but home was a grace. There was a grace on that season, there was a, how many of y'all have ever moved into a season and you're like, I don't even know why I should be happy right now, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Why? Because there's a grace on it, but there's also a grace to endure. There's also a grace to walk it out. There's also a grace to allow God to unlock courage in your life. So what do I mean by that? There's that home is not a place, but a grace all throughout our lives. We will begin to ask ourselves questions like, I wonder where I belong. Not so much an address or even a city. And maybe you've been uprooted or transplanted or you struggle right now. You're struggling in this season to find your place. And maybe you end up asking yourselves questions about your calling and your purpose and your value and your worth. Or, God, what's my contribution? Or how am I supposed to leave a legacy? And maybe you're only plagued by the consequences of your choices, wondering if different choices would have led to a better outcome. Here's the truth and here's the good news. When you walk with God and you find your home in him and you find grace to live life and finally belong in him, you simply won't find home anywhere else. I remember watching a movie with my kids, uh, Penguins of Madagascar. Do y'all know that movie? (laughs) Dave, you know that movie? (laughs) Some of you are like, what was that? You gotta know the movie because that was a weird moment. Okay, but somebody said about Another character said about these penguins, because penguins, just in case you didn't know, are not native to America. And a character said to the penguins, you're a long way away from home, aren't you? Because home is not just where you live, it's where you belong. And as humans, we will walk through life building homes and communities, friendships and family, yet somehow home seems fleeting. And I'll say it again, that again, home is where he is. The Bible says that God knit us together in our mother's womb, and that he formed us with intention. He created us unique and our unique design on purpose. He has predestined us for good works that he intended for us to accomplish before the foundations of the earth were even laid. He took his time on you. Look at the person next to you and say, he took his time on you. Now, don't get weird about it like he took his time on you, girl. That's weird. Don't do that. That got real weird. Now, in Genesis 127, I have been talking about this a lot throughout this year, that God, with intention to detail, and I love the diversity and the creativity of our God, he created us in his image. St. Augustine said it this way, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Because there is a, there's a pull in our soul and a pull in our spirit that's drawing to the one who is our creator. Ultimately knowing if you were in relationship with him, that this is not our final destination. This is a temporary place that ultimately we have a home in heaven that we can live forever and ever with our savior. And as believers, we have to reach this conclusion that if we have nothing else on this earth but Jesus, then we have home. If you have nothing else on this earth other than Jesus, you can find rest in him. But today, I'm not asking you to just take my word for it. Today, we're going to go through the study of a journey. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a biblical journey. And for those of you who are new to the faith, this will be fun. And for those of you who are seasoned saints, this will be a good reminder. But we're going to go through the study of a journey made by a group of people who are called by God. And he called them ultimately 
his own. And there's lessons and a foundation that he taught and he modeled for them to walk out. And today, we're going to be studying the exodus of the Israelites and the reason that God ultimately placed them on the road, placed them on a journey. So a little background here for those of you who are a little bit of uh, deeper saints, and maybe you just want to grow in your faith, a little background. The Israelites had been living in Egypt for over 400 years. The Egyptians, seeing the blessing of God on his people, begin to fear that they would soon overtake them and ultimately claim the Egyptians' home as their own. And in response to the favor and the prosperity of the Israelites, adversity began to be born. And according to the biblical account, the Israelites, led by Moses, ultimately escaped slavery in Egypt after enduring plagues and all these miraculous events. And they ended up wandering throughout the wilderness. How many of y'all know this story? Come on, amazing. They ended up wandering throughout the wilderness, leaving captivity, but honestly, was their home. They, it might have been captivity. It might have been a controlled environment, but it still was, it still was home. But they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. During that time, they received the Ten Commandments and other laws from God on Mount Sinai. And eventually, under the leadership of Josh, Joshua, they crossed the Jordan River, entered the land of Canaan, which was promised to them by God. And the journey is ultimately seen as a testament to their faith, their perseverance, their courage, ultimately the fulfillment of divine promises from God. So we're going to be taking a look from different excerpts and moments in the story and look at how God showed up. Come on, somebody say God showed up and he ultimately provided for them in a place that wasn't their home. You know what I love about the Bible when you're reading through the word and you say, God, you showed up for them in a place that wasn't their home, if you did it for them, you can do it for me. Like, you can take the biblical foundation, and because God's word is alive and sharper than a two-edged sword and doesn't return to him void, you can say, God, if you healed the woman in Matthew chapter 9 with the issue of blood, you can heal my body. God, if you showed up and you restored and delivered and set that family free, then I've got great news he can do for your life. Come on, how many of y'all are excited about that? So yeah, we're gonna read about the Israelites' journey but I need you to listen and I need you to connect because the Holy Spirit will put a deposit in your own heart and say, this right here applies to you. Because God ultimately freed and took care of them throughout the journey. And I want to encourage somebody for just a moment because yes, he provided in the wilderness and he showed up and promised to fulfill what he had promised. And there was moments of Great sorrow and moments of valleys, but there was also some victories. Yeah. There was also some wins. But let me encourage somebody for a moment that winning often comes with warfare. Yeah. Have you ever experienced that before? Where you're like, I'm on top of the world. Like, I feel like I'm on a mountaintop moment. And it's like, oh, I feel like I'm getting attacked from every angle. Anybody at all? Because winning oftentimes will come with warfare. Because here's the truth. The enemy will only attack what he deems as a threat. And he knows there's healing in your hands. He knows that if you will get bold about your faith and rise up and be who God has called you to be, son of the living God, mighty man of valor, Proverbs 31, daughter, he knows this. The enemy doesn't want to see you blessed. The enemy ultimately doesn't want to see you walk in freedom. The enemy doesn't want to see you devoted in relationship to Jesus. The enemy doesn't want to see you, your chains broken off and your shackles fall. But let me encourage somebody today. That broken part of your story is going to be the most powerful part of your testimony. And the enemy knows this. He knows once you get free and those shackles fall off, he doesn't own you anymore. And he's like, ah, oh, she got it. She figured it out. And in the midst of it, she got stronger. In the midst of it, his faith grew. So the old tricks of the enemy that used to hold you captive or draw you away from God, oh yeah, no, that's old news, devil. You should, try, you should probably try something new because I've already been set free and delivered and healed and restored from that mess. So the enemy, and this is not a scary thing because of the authority we walk with in the Lord, the enemy will wage war on you, trying to hold you captive, trying to convince you that you're better off with your neck under the enemy's foot, which is what happened as the story unfolds. We'll see that. We'll see that the children of Israel were held by Pharaoh, held, enslaved, and captive, and actually started gravitating back towards 
captivity, and sometimes that's our pattern, but I'm here to remind you this weekend that God is your great deliverer. And let me speak prophetically for a moment right now to everybody. The journey of change, the journey of your victory is beginning. The Lord is moving in your life. Some of y'all are about to walk out of a dead-end job, a season, a toxic relationship, a lifestyle that the enemy has been trying to hold you captive in. But God, in his mercy and his grace and his sovereignty and his goodness that has good plans for you, God has a reason for the journey he has you on of your now and your next. You know what he's waiting on? He's waiting on our obedience. He was waiting on Moses to rise up and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Under the unction and the boldness of God, he's waiting on our obedience. I don't know who needs to hear this. I wrote this down in my notes last night. This is not for everybody, but but y'all are gonna, somebody's gonna start laughing harder than you've cried throughout this past season because God is the God of being able to restore every area of your life. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm getting my joy back, but I'm also going to start smiling again and put that grin on them. Come on, just like that. Come on, wake up, put the grin on them. Some of y'all got that little, like, you got like a little diamond in your tooth. Like, just smile. (laughs) Ding. Have you ever had that one friend that spoils an ending to a movie? You know that one friend, they're like, have you seen? You're like, I haven't. I don't want to hear about it. It's okay. They broke up. You're like, what? (laughs) I didn't want to hear about it. No, he literally drowned. No, stop. (laughs) But then he came back to life. I'm like, I don't want to know anything else. Please stop talking. The beautiful thing about this story is I'm going to spoil the ending for a moment because God wasn't just calling the Israelites to, to a place to call home. He was calling them to fully depend, trust, and rely on him because God can never give them a home until they found their home in him. Some of you are like, ah, some of you, uh, you New, New Testament saints are like, PD, this is a lot of Old Testament, but it's also New Testament. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God above all else. Another translation says, as your first priority, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. That's a choice. And he will give you, say it out loud, everything I need, everything you need. See, God doesn't just give you a blessing. He is your blessing. And just like we wouldn't give our kids a gift to replace our presence in their lives, God isn't going to give us things. Come on, this is key. He's not going to give us things that we will ultimately use to replace him. That's why I've said for years, God will never give you a life where he's not necessary. If you're like, oh, no, I got this one on. This is on me, Lord. You do your thing. Go, go deal with that volcano issue. <laughs> no, no, but God will never give us a life and stuff and things where we can ultimately use them to replace him. So today I'm going to make the case for what faith really looks like. And while looking at the lessons that God has taught the Israelites and ultimately bringing them to the promised land, I appreciate how within this text, There are insights that we can learn from. The Israelites learned, and we can learn as well, that even though things throughout this journey in the wilderness seem blocked, God's way is always open. And sometimes we block our blessings. Our pride, our ego, our arrogance, our control issues, and sometimes things end up blocked, but God's way is always open. If you're taking down notes, the first thing the Israelites experienced through the unfailing love of God, was number one, write this down, he protects. I need somebody to grab that today. Come on, he protects, say he protects. This is part of the character of God. He protects. It sounds simple, but this is the first lesson that God taught the Israelites outside of Egypt, that when you are called by his name, you are under his protection. See, my kids know that mom and dad are going to protect them. Two in the morning last night, our alarm went, the thing went off. That was pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, I can't, nobody else can fact check that, only you. But, and y'all always jumped up like, let's go. Actually, I was very confused. I didn't know what was happening. It had said that there was a glass break in one of our windows. It was a false alarm. It was a false alarm. But you know what our kids knew? Mom and dad were going to protect them. Mom's guns and my gun. Let's go. What are we talking about? She works out all the time. Okay, moving on. So the Israelites, they have this moment, 
And it looked like the parting of the Red Sea. And they're standing at the shore of the Red Sea with the threat of an impending attack, attack from Pharaoh and his army. After Moses left to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Pharaoh changes his mind. He's like, you can go. Get out of here. I'm sick of these plagues. I'm sick of all this. Take those people and you serve your God and leave us alone. But he changes his mind and it says that he began to pursue them. And he took his army. And in verse six of Exodus 14, it says that Pharaoh took his own personal chariot. This is unreasonable and wild. And 600 of his best chariots. And then it says in the word in Exodus 6, or Exodus 14, verse 6, and all the other chariots in Egypt. Like, he's out of his mind. Like, let's go get these people. And ultimately pursued the Israelites. Pharaoh was committed to stopping them from leaving so that he could ultimately bring them back to be slaves and be held in captivity. But I love this. Watch how Moses, on the shore of the Red Sea, with authority by the hand and under the hand of God's mighty power. Now, pause real quick, because Moses, in a moment, we're going to read this in Exodus 14, verse 13 and 14. He's pretty bold in this moment, but if you are a student of the Bible and you go back to Exodus uh, 3, where he's standing at the burning bush and he kicks his shoes off, Moses has a dialogue, a, a complete conversation with the Lord about, hey, God, I think you should pick somebody else. Like, I'm slow in speech. I, I'm, I don't think I'm the guy. I think there's a lot of other people that are probably more qualified than me. You should probably choose them. And God said, I'll give you the words to say. So now speed ahead to Exodus 14. Now, a long time has gone. Now, for us, it's, it's 11 uh, uh, chapters, but this is a, a span of time. Now watch Moses' boldness under the authority of God. Moses answered the people on the screens, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. This part right here was bold. The Egyptians you see today, they could see them off in the distance, their chariots coming, smoke, smoke, dust. <laughs> They're just on chariots smoking, like, like what is happening? <laughs> dust. They can see it in the distance, and Moses says this, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. He had a boldness and a confidence that God was protecting him. This is super cheesy. He was confident, but he had confidence. Okay. Now, this, this verse 14, Pastor Jackie loves this verse. This has been one of our foundation verses we've built our lives on. It says this, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Come on, somebody shout out loud. The Lord is fighting for me. Lord is fighting for me. Later on in Exodus 14, we read that through divine intervention, supernaturally, God parted the Red Sea, allowing the Israelites to pass through on dry ground. And as the Egyptians followed and pursued them, the waters ultimately closed in around them, defeating the enemy. I was reading this atheist study about the parting of the Red Sea and how there is proof with science, archaeologists, that this moment happened. They can't understand it. They will claim it was a weird weather event. We know biblically God showed up and he parted the Red Seas to protect his people. Come on, somebody. I love in the book of Psalms, David wrote all these poetic, almost, they were, they were songs. And he talked about the protector and he talked about the promises of God through protection. Psalms 91 verse four through six says he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. He says, do not be afraid of the terrors of night. That's what happened. <laughs> Nor the arrow that flies by day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Psalms 28, 7, David continues on and says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. Why? He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with a song I will praise him. Come on, somebody say where he is and where I am. I know that I have protection. Come on, give God a shout of praise if you believe that he is your protector. My heart leaps with joy. Y'all, that's what the sound of 
the heart of a man and a woman sounds like who has found home in the presence of God, which leads me to point number two. So the first one's he protects. Number two, he provides. This is a little simple, but this is the process of what God poured out upon the children of Israel and that he will pour out on us, that we have access to his protection. We also have access to his provision. When you find home in him, you also find his provision. Maybe some of y'all can relate to this. Uh, and I told you I was going to give my mom a shout out. My mom was a really good cook. She still is. My, well, I said was. My mom's like, I'm still alive, boy. Like, <laughs> you're still a good cook. And this is the truth. Hands down. Pastor Jackie has picked up a lot of phenomenal cooking skills. She's amazing. You're incredible. But there's one thing that we have not been able to capture, and I don't know what it is. I think it's just a mom, uh, um, um, like a mom mom. Like she's a mom, but then there's like mom mom. Like my mom, my, my mom. She's my kid's mom, but then there's my mom. My mom has an anointing to make meatloaf. I can't even, how many of y'all like meatloaf? How many of y'all was like, that's gross. I don't, I will not eat that. You vegans, I love you. You can do tof tofurkey loaf. I don't know. That's enough. Stop. I don't want to step on any toes. It's too early. My mom's meatloaf is next level. And there was a season where we were broke, broke. Like broke is a joke, broke. And how many of y'all have the ability to just look up in that cupboard and just grab things out of the cupboard or the fridge? You're like, <sighs> and you can just whip up something like you're on that show chopped. Like my mom had that ability. And I knew when I came home, if I saw my mom wearing that apron, then, then there was going to be good food because home looked like good food. How many of y'all like that show Chopped? Like for real? Like, do you ever watch that show? Like they open, how many of y'all have never watched the show Chopped? I want to encourage you. It's, it's amazing. They take, they take three or four contestants and then they have what they call basket ingredients. This has nothing to do with the message. I'm just giving you pearls here. And they open up the basket ingredients and they're like red snapper. And they're like, okay. And they're like black jelly beans. They're like, that's interesting. <laughs> Bean sprouts and whipped cream. They're like, what can I do? And then at the very end, they're really like, they're like pretty like, like almost arrogant about it. Like I call this blackened red snapper with demi glaze bean sprout souffle. I'm like, that's amazing. How many of y'all have that skill? Wave at me if you can do that. You can. But I knew showing up with expectation that my mom was going to be able to figure it out. Y'all, God is the God of provision. But as adults, we lose sight of this because we get conditioned to carry all the weight, everything we're dealing with on our own shoulders. And then we take up this attitude that says, I bet on me instead of relying on his own, instead of relying on his strength. Now, the Lord does call us to work, just so y'all know. Some of you are like, Pastor Daniel said, I don't have to work anymore. Lord does call us to work, <laughs> to provide and supply and take care of our families and children. But he also, watch this, he never stops playing the role of our father. And where God is, y'all, there is provision. Come on, say amen if you believe that. There is provision. So as for me and my family, Jackie and I have decided, as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord and the presence of God will dwell in our house and we will eat good. Somebody say, amen. Come on. Attempt to say, amen. Y'all are on the Easter choir. Amen. You didn't realize you just auditioned. But ultimately, we see how God models this for the Israelites. He was teaching them, you have to trust me in this wandering season because yes, God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and we love that. He's, he's, he's the beginning, and he's the end, but he's also the God of the middle, and he will provide, and this is what he's trying to show the Israelites. If you'll trust me, there will be provision that even in the land where there is famine, even in the land where there is drought, even in the land where there feels like there is nonstop lack, if you'll trust me and you'll recognize that I'm for you, I can provide everything you need. Watch this. For us, that need may be debt. You may be struggling right now with need. And maybe you're finding yourself consistently in this place of wondering, God, where are you? But when you find yourself consistently in his presence, the peace you need, the wisdom you need, the courage you need, the fight you need to push through, it's all found in him. It's all found in him. I, I need wisdom. It's found in his presence. I need courage of what to do next. It's found in his presence. I need discernment. It's found in his presence. 
I need God to know how to navigate my budget and my finances. There's wisdom through the power of God, through financial advisors. And I've said this, and we're going to be starting it soon. We're going to be starting classes where you can get your money right, get your budget right, get your life right. Amen. But the truth is, when we trust in God and we recognize everything is found in your presence. But look at this backstory for a moment. This is how the Lord provided for the Israelites in their time of need. Exodus 16. This journey is awesome. Verse 11 through 15. The Lord says to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. <laughs> I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Moses, I could hear it. Moses, at least we had a meal. It was a hot pocket, but it was a meal. At least we had a place to lay down. Now I was a slave. I was in captivity. They worked us hard, and it was brutal conditions, but... I guess it wasn't that bad. The grumbling started. And Moses is cheering them on saying, guys, 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 listen, there's a promise on the other side of this season. There's a promise of God fulfilling the land of Canaan in our lives if you'll just, if you'll just trust him. But watch this. If we're not careful, sometimes captivity can seem more comfortable than where God is leading you. That relationship that you know is broken. Yeah, but at least he's nice to me. You know, He's nice to me a couple days a week. At least she hasn't cheated on me. And, you know, she only did that once. At least that situation. No, we end, up draw, we end up going back to something that was comfortable. We end up staying in a place that we know God is saying, hey, I want to breathe new life in your life. I want to put a fresh wind behind your sail. But sometimes captivity can seem more comfortable than where God is leading us. We pick it up. The Lord said to Moses, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat. And in the morning, you will be filled with bread, even a gluten-free option. That's what it says in my Bible. Is this the gluten-free edition, Jackie? <laughs> then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Verse 13 says, that evening, quail came. Some of you are like, what's quail? It's like a fa fancy pigeon. <laughs> and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. Not mountain dew, just dew. Come on, this is the way I read the Bible. This is fun. Verse 14, when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. You know where I'm going with this. This is where frosted flakes started. <laughs> See what God did? He was like, this is how Kellogg's got started right here. Before they started putting all the GMOs in there. Amen. <laughs> Verse 15, when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. He not only protects, but he provides. And I love this, that God will provide not just what you need, but he will provide something unique for you. Y'all, that uniqueness, that favor that he puts on your life, yeah, that's called favor. That's for you. Why? Because you're a child of God. There's special provision unlike anything the world has ever seen. That's the favor of you being a king's kid. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, I'm God's favorite. Come on, let them know. Look at your second choice and say, that's why I get the better parking spot. Come on, just. <laughs> we have access to draw from a storehouse that the world doesn't have access to. This bread, this manna was sweet. It was nutritionally dense. And ultimately, it sustained them throughout the day. But it was unique for God's people. It wasn't raining frosted flakes across the entire region. God showed up, provided quail, provided bread, and this is wild, because this is what we do in our humanity. Whenever they would hoard it, it would spoil and go bad. Because they were panicked that it wouldn't show up again tomorrow. So they would hoard it. You ever, you ever bought like a loaf of bread and you put it in your car and by the time you get home, you're like, it's already molding? I'm like, what is happening? No, they would, they would hoard it. It would go bad. And it was God saying, hey, hey, I need you to trust that I am your daily bread. I need you to trust that I'm going to show up again tomorrow and again the next day. And again, come on, somebody say out loud, God's my provider. But regardless, there are provisions. There's provisions that God has stored up for us. And for you, there's a provision that God wants to place in your hands. But to see it, you may need to follow him by faith into the very place it seems least likely to appear. There has been seasons where God has led Pastor Jackie and I into seasons and we're like, God, God, are you sure? Like, you sure? Like, did I hear you? Or was this a familiar spirit? Like, but then we saw God's hand 
in the midst of it. I've said this for years. The waiting season doesn't have to be a wasted season. He will provide and protect all throughout. How many of y'all are grateful for a good God? Come on, one more time. All right, and lastly, the Lord was teaching the Israelites this lesson. Number three, write this down, that he directs. He directs. He protects, he provides, and he directs. God wasn't just protecting to protect or providing to provide. He was protecting and providing because he was ultimately directing his people's hearts back to him. Exodus 40 Verse 36 through 38 says it this way, and all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all of their travels. There was also more significance too. The cloud during the day protected them from the sun. Look how good God is. But the fire at night, Gave him warmth. He provides, he protects, and he directs. And I truly believe that God still desires to lead his people like this. But we have to follow him. Some of us will pray passionately for God to bring us into new seasons. God, I need a new season. 2024, there's more for me. And you're in March and you're like, God, do you hear my prayers? Like, I don't even, hey, it's me again. <laughs> No, 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 we pray passionately for God to bring us into new seasons, but when he begins to lead, we get cold feet, refusing to take the leap of faith. We say, God, I don't know if it's right. I'm not sure I'm the right person for that. You might say, not me, Pastor Daniel, I'm in step. You're walking around singing Drake's song, God's plan. Like, you're like in step and you feel like you have it figured out, but here's the truth. I'm gonna step on some toes for a moment. God's plan is that you would have a generous heart. God's plan is that you would support his church and the mission of the gospel through your tithe and ultimately you'll experience a blessing. God's plan is that you would serve the house of the Lord through signing up. Today, we're gonna have more of our team out in the lobby for you to sign up. Y'all, we saw 340 people sign up to jump on the dream team last weekend alone. That's amazing. Over 70 just for kids and all the children's workers say, amen, like that's a big deal. No, he wants you to serve so that he can bless you to serve. He wants you to jump into mission projects so that you can really experience what it looks like to be the hands and feet of Jesus. He wants you to join an HC, HC group. Why? Because gathering together as he instructs us to do, we end up finding real relationships and community here through his local church. These are the three things that every believer we're called to actively engage in giving, serving, and gathering. If you're not doing this, this is going to be a little bit of a tough line. You're probably not moving where he's moving. I still don't know why I don't, why I'm not sensing his presence. It's beautiful what God will do in a community. It's amazing what God will do through relationships. It's amazing in a Proverbs 27, 17 moment where iron sharpens iron when you're going through something or you need encouraged and you've got a brother or a sister that's surrounding you saying, hey, just so you know, I went through that in 2012, came out on the other side. You're gonna come out on the other side. God is gonna show up. He did it for me and trust me, if he did it for me, he can do it for you. It's bibs versus aprons. Like Pastor Peter talked about last week, Moving from a season of being only a recipient to being a producer, to being a provider, not just a spectator, but a participator, not someone that we just count, but someone that he can count on. With every eye closed just for a moment, God, my prayer today is that we would find our cadence, we would find our rhythm of following the cloud by day and the pillar by night that we would hear your voice, that we would be in your presence and that we would find our cadence and we'd stay in sync and alignment. Well, how do I do that, Pastor Daniel? By simply seeking his faith, face, by allowing faith to grow, by being in his presence daily, by pursuing his plan and ultimately trusting his timing. And all throughout the Israelites' journey with every eye closed, God was directing his people back to trusting him because when you think of home, maybe you think of peace, rest, joy, provision, love. 
so many good things, but oftentimes in this world, they're temporary at best. But when we place our trust in God's hands, we place our trust in, in his heart for our lives, we find peace. You'll find rest. You'll find that joy, that provision, and a love that surpasses all understanding. God, today, I thank you for every person here, Katie Woodlands. God, what a great reminder today that throughout the scriptures, you show your mighty hand of protection, of provision, and direction because you have a great plan for our lives. With every eye closed, just for a moment, if you're here and you say, Pastor Daniel, here's the truth. Relying on his protection, his provision, and his direction, I don't know Jesus like that. I don't even know if he would accept me where I'm at. One of the most amazing things about the unfailing love and the grace and the mercy of God that's new every morning is that he'll take you in as he's found you, but he won't leave you the way he found you. To change you, heal you, set you free, send you in a trajectory of the assignment that's on your life, and you can experience his protection. You can experience his provision. And when you listen to his voice and you're in relationship with him, you'll ultimately experience his direction, just like the children of Israel did. When they were uprooted from captivity that maybe they considered home, on the other side of everything they endured, Joshua led them into the land of Canaan. Everything that God had promised, he fulfilled in their lives. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I want to. Or maybe the second invitation, you'd say, I want to rededicate my life today. The, the truth is, I, I used to walk with him. I've experienced his protection, provision, and direction, but not in a long time because I've relied on my own strength. I started pursuing my own agendas. I started pursuing my own ideology, my own initiatives. Maybe you have gotten distracted and pulled off course. It's okay. Today's a day of restoration. I'm gonna to count to three. I promise I won't embarrass you. If you're watching online, you wanna say yes to Jesus or rededicate, just say it right there. Our moderators and our team with our age crew, they'll help you right there. But if you're in the room here, Katie, Woodlands, I want you to, right now, one, I wanna give my life to Jesus. And when I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, I wanna see your hand. Today's my day. I see you and 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 you and you. And you you and amazing beautiful come on we're all gonna pray this prayer together come on say this out loud Jesus it's me from today on I'm choosing to live wholeheartedly for you here's my sin here's my shame here's my struggles I ask for your forgiveness thank you Jesus for giving up your life for mine so that I can live a life of hope and a life filled with freedom. I want to experience your protection, your provision, and I want you to direct my life for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise?